All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the IUPAC Word for Chemistry webinar series. My name is Fadima Mustafa. I'll be co-hosting this event along with my uh, colleague Ian Bruno. We are today here to discuss the third webinar in our series, the user perspective on digital machine readable depictions. This webinar is brought to you by the IUPAC and also sponsored by and hosted by the American Chemical Society Publications and the ACS Division of Chemical Information. Thank you for all of one who joined us today and thank you for our amazing guest speaker who accepted our invitation to talk about those, those chemical detections and she smiles home graphical representation and systematic nomenclature. In this, today, in this program, in today's program, we're gonna be starting by a short introduction about our project. Then we will have flash talks, five minutes talks for each of the, uh, for each of our speakers. And then we will be joined by a panel discussion before we go to uh, the final closing remarks of having uh, our um, upcoming events announced. And uh, we would love as well to have your uh, feedback about our event. So briefly, what is the digital IUPAC and what we do in the World for a Chemistry Project? IUPAC since many years now, they have been uh, translating the chemical standards into the digital domain with a goal of developing machine processable and readable depictions. Uh, the most three pillars, what the IUPACs are focused on are the chemical representation, chemical concept definitions, and chemical properties date and data. Since um, last June, uh, there is a new global initiative called the World Fair Project, a project funded by the European Commission, uh, coordinated by the RDA and the CODATA. It started this project to advance implementation of the concept of fair data principle, findable, accessible, interpretable, and reusable. The, uh, this project actually uh, have 11 cases and chemistry is one of them and IUPAC is the leading authority of this project. Here in the IUPAC, we are trying to um, making IUPAC assets fair. So we had uh, this project, which is led by Leah McCowan, split it into three main uh, sub projects. And the first project is called the reporting guidance, which is led by Ian Prono is with us tonight, today. And this uh, subgroup uh, are working to develop guidance protocols for handling chemical data in a fairly manner. The second project is uh, the training cookbook, which they are trying to develop online material on how to manage digital data files and content. This subgroup is led by Stuart Chalk. The last one is the protocol services. They are working on developing web-based services to confirm chemical identity and machine readability of chemical data. This subgroup is led by Ian, uh, by uh, Evan Bolton. So with those subgroups uh, are working hard, we were trying uh, since September uh, to have some outreach activities. That's why we have this webinar series. We have we had one in September, we had one in October. All of the recordings are av available at the IUPAC YouTube channel and our Zenodo community, which I will share later. So uh, the, the effort here is to try to interact with the um, the, uh, the data community and try to understand how chemical data is being used, what are the challenges in the field and what, how the IUPAC can help. That's why we are here today. Um, with that, I'll be uh, uh, moving to introduce our moderator for this, uh, uh, for this webinar, Ian Prono, who, as I mentioned, is a lead of uh, one of those subprojects. Ian um, had a PhD uh, for information science from University of Sheffield. He has been working since many, many years now at the CCTC, which is the Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center as a scientific software engineer. And he contributed to the development of many core software products, most notably the Conquest. He has been active in many and a range of global initiatives, including the REA, the IUPAC, and the International Union of the Crystallography, and, inter, uh, and he is also the secretary of uh, NCHI Trust. Uh, without further ado, um, Ian. Thank you very much, Fatima, um, and welcome everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today for this webinar. Um, we're going to start with some polls just to find out a little bit about your perception of the area of digital machine readable depictions of um, 
uh, chemical structures. So if we could launch the poll, um, there's more than one question here, so you will need to scroll down. There is a total of three questions. Um, the first of these is to ask you about chemical representations that you may use, and you have multiple choice. Um, the second is to ask you about how often you use these. So you'll have to do an aggregate here because there's just one choice. And then we'd really like to know how solved the challenge of chemical representation is for your needs. So we'll give it a moment while um, you answer. Uh, I hope everyone can see it because um, it's telling me at the moment that zero of three people have answered, but I know there's about 53 people on the call. So. Ian, people are answering. Um, Excellent, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, just let me know when you're ready up to end it. Well, do you, do you have a sense of do you have a sense of how many? Uh, we got about 63 um, percent. OK. What are we up to now? Um, kind of holding at 63, so I'll go ahead okay. and end it and display. Okay. Brilliant. Let's see what you think. Okay, we have a lot of use of Inchi, which is good to see. Um, smiles, less use of Helm. This is chemistry. Helm, as we'll hear about, is more targeting the biological space. Um, and then a reasonable representation of some of the more traditional ways of representing structures. And they're all very important to you um, with 80% um, of you almost using them often. And Okay, in terms of how solved the challenge is, 3% um, of you think it's excellent. None of you think it's not at all solved, but I think a slightly reassuring response of 61% here saying that it's adequate um, and then 40% limited. So possibly still some work to do and that's possibly something that we'll explore a little bit when we come to the panel discussion. Okay, so thank you very much for engaging with that. Um, gonna move us now on to the first of our um, uh, a talks and introduce to you um, Greg Landrum. And as I make this introduction, if you'd like to maybe take control, Greg, and start sharing your slides. Um, we saw in that poll that um, Inchi is quite important um, to a lot of you. We wanted to feature Inchi in this session. Um, and there's lots of people in the community we could have gone to to give us a very in-depth um, sort of exploration of the strengths, weaknesses of Inchi and what have you. But what we wanted to really try and get across here was more of a sort of user perspective on Inchi. Uh, I think Greg is someone who's very well placed to do this. He's had a number of years of experience in industry, um, working in computational chemistry and cheminformatics. He's worked at Nine, working on workflow tools, but um, will be known to many of you as the sort of developer of RD Kit, a tool that very much relies on reliable chemical identifiers and representations. So very pleased, Greg, that you can join us and look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Ian. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about Inchi um, and providing a bit of a user's perspective on the Inchi itself, as well as identifiers and representations in general. Um, and as any good computer user, um, I first started by trying to figure out how I could get out of this by having a machine write my slides for me. Um, so I started with by going to chat GPT, um, which is good. There's been some um, noise about this recently. It's this amazing neural network where you can ask it questions and carry on conversations. And I had it write some of my slides. So let's see how it did. Um, so I started with what is NG? I um, mean, it's uh, it actually gives a reasonably good short definition of NG, which you can see here. So it's a standardized open source way of representing the chemical structures of molecules. Um, it uses a hierarchical text-based format to encode connectivity and arrangement of atoms, as well as any other relevant information such as isotopes and tautomers. Um, it's been designed to be machine readable, easily searchable and compatible with a wide range of chemical software. And it's often used as an alternative to things like canonical smiles. Um, so I thought that was pretty good. So I figured I'd ask it a harder question, which is what a chemical representation is. Here, it's um, not necessarily so great. So it says it's a way of representing the chemical structure of a substance using a specific notation or format. Um, it can be in a variety of different forms, um, including chemical identifiers or shorthand notations. And then it's good about what they're for. So representations are used to communicate and share information about chemical substances with other scientists and researchers. 
um, and they allow for precise and consistent identification of chemicals and can be used to predict properties and behavior. Um, so I thought this was actually pretty good. Let me give you my very brief one sentence definition of a chemical representation. Um, it is just a method of capturing and communicating what a compound actually is um, at, at, at least some level of detail. And there's different representations that capture things at different levels of detail. Um, so what's an identifier? Um, I gave GP2 a chance to do this I and mean, didn't do a very good job the first time. So I let it try again in a later conversation. Um, and here's a better and a reasonable answer. Um, so it's a unique code or notation that is used to identify a specific chemical substance. Um, they provide a consistent and standardized way of identifying chemicals. And then there's some more text. Um, GP2, um, uh, chat GPT is reasonably verbose, um, so I won't read all of it. But it's nice down at the bottom, it gives some examples. Some, so INCHI is an identifier, CAS numbers are identifiers, and the European Chemical Agency identifiers are identifiers. Um, this is what the INCHI team thinks an identifier is. So this is from the INCHI paper. Um, I quite like this definition. So it's a text label that denotes a chemical substance, um, and they're of the utmost importance because they provide a convenient means of capturing or comparing and distinguishing chemicals. So for me, the key feature that a chemical identifier allows us to easily answer, um, or that allows us to do is easily answer the question, are these two compounds the same? So if I get the identifier for two compounds, if the identifiers are the same, they're the same compound. So what is the difference between these two? I've talked about representation and I've talked about identifier. This isn't a great example from chat um, GPT, so I'm not going to go through it in detail. Um, let's just look at kind of a high level at the tasks that we might use these things for. Um, so things you might do with representations are describe a compound structure, um, communicate that structure to other people, um, or allow an identifier to be constructed. Because if you're going to get an identifier for a compound, you have to start from some form of the structure. What do you do with identifiers? You can determine whether or not two compounds are the same. We talked about that already. Um, we can look compounds up in databases just by looking the identifiers up. Um, or given an identifier, you can retrieve a compound representation to do further work with it. So INCHI, which is what I'm supposed to be talking about, um, is that a representation or an identifier? Um, I asked ChatGPT, and um, it had a problem. So they couldn't come up with an answer. It took a minute or two to generate this so-called response. Um, so there's some confusion in the community actually about whether INCHI is an identifier or a representation. And it looks like we've managed to, to um, transmit our confusion to the machines as well. So here's my take on that. Um, it's kind of both. Um, so from the INCHI paper, this, this indented section, here's an excerpt from the paper. And one of the things the team said is that one of the things that they thought was important when designing INCHI, but not critical, was the ability to exactly restore the original chemical structure based solely on the INCHI. I mean, that's a characteristic of an identifier. So I would say from the usual definition terms, this makes, sorry, that's the characteristic of a representation. So I would say from the usual definition of terms, this really means that INCHI is an identifier, more of an identifier than it is a representation. However, it is being used as a representation all over the place. Um, many, many people do use it as a representation. So I'm waffling, so maybe I should give a straight answer. Um, so I think it's primarily an identifier um, because acting as a representation was specifically not a primary goal. However, we can use it as a rep representation. It's the way it's built. And I think it's a, um, that's a nice thing to have. Um, why is this problem there? Why can't it be both? And the, the problem is, is that when you create an NG, there's a molecular standardization process that is done that, that gets the molecule into a normal form. Um, and that means it modifies the structure of the molecule before generating the NG, um, which is a feature for a chemical identifier, but it's problematic for, for a representation. This isn't just theoretical. Um, this really does happen in real life. This is this becomes relevant. Um, these are two examples of structures from the CCDC. Um, these are two tautomers of the same molecule. They are isolatable. They form distinct crystal structures. They can be physically observed. However, because of the, the work that NG does, the way NG is structured, these two collapse to be the same thing. So if you're using NG as your representation, you will never be able to tell the difference between these two things with standard NG. So this is actually a real concern sometimes. So to wrap up, um, what is NG? 
it's it's a chemical identifier, but you can and many people do use it as a representation. When you're doing that, you just need to be aware of its limitations. So what happens to the structures underneath the hood? But it is still, I think in the end, it is super convenient to have this identifier that also has some form of representation encoded within it. So you can look at the identifier and tell what the structure is. And with that, I would like to let ChatGPT um, thank you for, for me. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions if we're doing that now or if we can wait till the panel. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Greg. And thank you for uh, introducing us to the sort of joys of um, chat GPT. Um, and I just love that it reflects our confusion in the wider community too. Um, it's amazing. <laughs> absolutely. Um, yeah. And in terms of questions, I think if you've got any immediate questions that you want to um, specifically target at Greg, please put them in the chat and I'm sure um, Greg will monitor the chat, um, but if you've got more general questions or thoughts, then we'll hold those over to the um, 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 discussion afterwards. So thank you very much. Um, we're going to move now on to our next talk. So Vin, if you'd like to start sharing your slides. Um, Greg, uh, chat GPT, you told us about canonical smiles in some of these. Um, um, some of its answers, and we've got not an artificial intelligence, but a real intelligence here in the form of Vince Galfani, um, who's an associate um, professor at, in the university libraries at the University of Alabama. Um, I think, you know, my, my, my view on Vin is that he's an enthusiast astic advocate for the understanding application and improving digital representations and in sort of like training future generations in their value and their strengths. Um, Vin chairs the IUPAC subcommittee on cheminformatics data standards and contributes to various IUPAC projects, one of which is all to do with smiles. And so he's here to talk to us about um, smiles. So Vin, over to you. Great, thank you, Ian, and uh, thank you for everyone for your attendance. Um, so I'm going to jump right in. So what what are smiles? Uh, smiles are a, a compact line notation, so simplified uh, molecular input line entry system. It's a compact line notation for representing molecules and reactions. And there's a variety of rules to encode different features of molecules, but here are the four sort of core rules of smiles in that um, atoms are represented by their atomic symbols. Um, single bonds and normal hydrogen valence are implied. Um, but if you want to represent double and triple bonds, you can do that with an equal sign or a pound symbol, respectively. Branching, you can use um, parentheses. And then ring closures use uh, digits, so numbers, to represent you know, which atoms are connected. They are a um, quite human-friendly notation. Um, but also machine processable. And they were introduced in the late 1980s and really developed and popularized by uh, daylight chemical information systems. Um, they're very convenient for computing. So you could typically reproduce the molecular representation um, as drawn. Um, they can generally, I, I won't say all software, but most um, chemical drawing packages and chem informatics toolkits will parse smiles. And so you'll be able to read in smiles. Uh, once you interpret the smiles with the software, you can then um, uh, you can then do sort of downstream calculations, or you can create a, a depiction. And it's typically how it was originally drawn. There's um, not any type of normalization um, usually. Uh, they're very convenient to store and process. So uh, since they're um, ASCII strings, they're um, quite small in memory. You can easily incorporate them into uh, spreadsheets, machine readable formats like XML, JSON, um, data frames, and other file formats. So they're, they're quite convenient for working with chemical data. Um, from my perspective, so I'm a, I'm a chemistry librarian. Um, I use smiles a lot for chemical information discovery. So for example, you can take a smile string and recreate the structure in um, tools like CAS Draw. So if you want to do a SciFinder search, you can copy that smile string, paste it into the drawing tool so you don't have to redraw it um, every time. You could do uh, PubChem and Google patent searches with Smile. So it allows you to then take that structure again, copy paste it into an online database and immediately 
um, search for um, chemical structures and chemical information. And then um, SMILES and uh, SMART to superset, which I won't necessarily talk about um, today, are useful for defining uh, molecular patterns and substructure searching. Um, they're also very convenient for turning chemical um, information searches into programmatic searches. So since, again, they're a, a line notation, you can pretty easily incorporate SMILES notations into uh, various web services. Um, so you can incorporate SMILES into a web service call. Here's an example um, using a bash script to um, use the PubChem web server to um, loop through a list of SMILES here and then return the molecular formula for each SMILES. So they're very convenient for turning chemical structure searches into programmatic searches. And SMILES um, development uh, really continues and inspires related formats, which is um, quite exciting to me with the notation that was sort of introduced in the 1980s. Um, so there are continued um, development on extensions to represent uh, wider chemical space like uh, or, or, or organometallics. So here's a Date of bond extension for RD kit. There are um, uh, recent publications on sort of variations of smiles to represent the macromolecular space, big smiles. Um, deep smiles was developed for machine learning applications and, and so on. So um, smiles continues to really excite the community. Um, so unlike Inchi, um, smiles are. Um, so Inchi is the, the standard is the software. Smiles doesn't have a software uh, implementation that's a standard. It's it's a, uh, a specification document. And so this can sometimes lead to disagreements between um, software and toolkits. So things like um, extensions that were implemented in you know, toolkit A may not necessarily be accepted by toolkit B. Um, here's one example where um, three-digit ring closures may be accepted by some toolkits and not others as well as the, it could lead to some parsing differences and really differences in, in hydrogen counts are, um, I won't say common, but one of the more problematic uh, issues where there's just uh, disagreements there. Um, so there's been a, a several efforts to um, increase the interoperability of SMILES. So one is in the 1990s with Exchange SMILES, where this is um, a slight modification of SMILES to remove the model of aromaticity. Um, I won't get into that um, at the moment, but suffice it to say it's necessary for, uh, or it's useful for creating unique representations of smiles and substructure recognition. Um, so if you remove that, there's less ambiguity in interpreting smiles. Um, open smiles was an effort or is an effort to create an open specification of smiles and they clarified many ambiguities in the daylight smiles documentation. The last update to the daylight specification was in 2011. And then um, a major work from uh, Noel Boyle um, looking at smiles parsing across, I think, 10 or 12 different toolkits really identified a lot of the common issues of smiles parsing across toolkits. And then lastly, uh, we have an effort in IUPAC called Smiles Plus, which is an ongoing effort to create and maintain an up-to-date specification. So with that, I'll, I'll stop there. Ian, I think you're muted. Thank you. Thank you for spotting that. So you, you did what you didn't hear me say was to say thank you very much, Vin, for talking us through smiles and identifying those nuances. I think there's an interesting, the slide, I think, where you talked about those sort of developments of smiles, to particularly to sort of start addressing machine learning. I think that raises some interesting questions, um, which, again, maybe we want to explore in the panel is uh, to what extent are the representations we're using today based on computing paradigms of the 1980s and 90s, and to, you know, are they appropriate for the sort of computation needs of um, later but um, thank you Vin for, for that and as I say before if anyone's got specific questions for Vin now drop them in the chat general questions let's save them over for the um, discussion right we're going to move a bit away from chemistry now um, and over more into the sort of biological arena um, our next speaker is Dana van der Waal, um, who's had a number of years of experience in pharma R&D, but has also been involved in a number of standards-related projects, 
um, including the Allotrope Foundation, apparently have a mission to revolutionize the way we acquire, share, and gain insights from scientific data. So hopefully Dana's gonna bring us some insights there. Um, Dana has been a contributor to IUPAC in recent years, and he is currently heading up the Helm project. Um, and Dana is going to tell us all about Helm. So Dana, over to you. Thank you, Ian. Um, so yeah, I'm going to give you a quick five minute introduction and overview to the hierarchical editing language for macromolecules or Helm. So um, the growth of uh, an antibodies, antibody drug conjugates, peptides, nucleic acid based therapeutics, what we might call biomolecules, uh, really presented some interesting challenges in the depiction and description of these molecules for informatics tools uh, or as machine readable um, descriptions. Uh, whereas small molecules, you know, have had pretty mature representations that we've seen for some time ago. Um, you know, sequence-based um, representations were, were okay and did support a lot of science. But as the field turned to the discovery and development of these biomolecules into drugs, um, there, there was actually a need to be able to understand things deeper than sequence and combine things of different types of entities. And, and actually at times deal with things at the atomic level as these new therapeutics are being uh, discovered and developed. Uh, things like coupling you know, uh, a small molecule drug to an antibody, for example, an antibody drug conjugate, presented challenges in, in machine readable descriptions. And it was that challenge and some unmet informatics needs for biologics discovery at Pfizer that actually gave rise to the, to the development of the Helm notation uh, and, and tools. And, Shortly after uh, publication of a, a seminal manuscript describing Helm, uh, Pfizer essentially brought this concept to Pistoia and the Pistoia Alliance as a pre-competitive collaboration across uh, pharma industry, uh, took on this project to help Pfizer put Helm in the public domain and put the tools that they created to date in, uh, in, in open source repository. And so through subsequent rounds of funding, through member companies that were interested in developing and using this standard and tools further, uh, Helm evolved through extensions of the specification itself, the creation of additional tools, the so building of a community to support users and, and companies doing implementation, uh, some, some test sets, and ultimately a, a set of core monomers for, for nucleic acids and peptides. And if we look at um, the description of Helm, the, 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 the term hierarchical derives from the fact that biomolecules are actually polymers at multiple levels. And we can also look at it as, as describing these molecules at multiple levels of abstractions, you'll see. So if we take the simple example I have on the screen here, we've got uh, a small RNA coupled to a small peptide by way of a chemical linker. Now, of course, that complex polymer breaks down into two simple polymers, the RNA and the peptide, each of which then is described by monomers. And those monomers in the specification are described ultimately at the atomic level. So you can see we can go from a very abstract representation all the way down to the atomic level of the monomers and back and forth. Now we'll look at a couple of examples of what the Helm notation looks like. And the first thing you'll notice is this is another line notation like Inchi or Smile. So it's very convenient in terms of working with informatics tools, but it's just created to deal with much, much larger molecules. And uh, the general structure of the, the schematic is that you first have your list of simple polymers, list of connections uh, between them, the list of potentially list of polymer groups and optionally uh, annotations added to that. So in the first example, I'm showing a peptide with a mix of both naturally and unnaturally occurring amino acids, right? So this is one of the early value propositions that uh, Helm filled in with the other sequence-based formats, really didn't have full support for chemically modified uh, monomers compared to the natural ones. 
In the second example, it illustrates being able to describe the cyclization of a peptide and the linkage to an additional chemical moiety, this DA, along with the inclusion of additional um, uh, non-naturally occurring amino acids. This example illustrates how the, the uh, notation also supports describing the base pairing in nucleic acids, effectively giving you some simple uh, uh, 2D structure in this case. So after the description of the uh, individual monomers uh, in, the, in the string in itself, then it, we describe the, the base pairs in the connection list here. Now, ambiguity in these structures in biologics in general is much more prevalent in chemistry. And that presents an interesting challenge um, because we wanna be as specific as possible. So how do you get specific about ambiguity? Which seems like an oxymoron. And this particular drug is a great example of how that works. So this is Kedsila. It's a combination of trastuzumab, an antibody binds to HER2, coupled to DM1, another cytotoxic small molecule through this, through this uh, linker, this chemical linker. Now, this linkage occurs at lysines, but it's not um, deterministic. It could couple to zero, up to eight different uh, lysines, on average about, about three and a half at a time. So you, this is easy to describe in words, but you can imagine that's difficult to describe in a single line notation. But this is what the Helm notation looks like. Um, if you'll bear with me for a minute. So first we see the description of the four peptides, the individual chains of the antibody, the linkage between the two chemical modes, and then uh, I failed to mention, of course, the linkage both inter and intra peptide cross links that make up the antibody structure. And then here at the very end, which I've bolded and colored more, demonstrates that we can declare that this chemical moiety is linked to a lysine and potentially any lysine within this group of peptides that we've described here. And then finally, that linkage occurs at a ratio of 3.5 to one. So you can see this is actually a very powerful level of detail in a single line notation. Of course, to make this useful, we need to go from the conceptual and develop embedded into tools that the scientists actually use like editors to create new monomers and helm strings, edit antibodies, search tools, and of course, uh, the integration into the commercial electronic lab notebooks and limb systems so that these things can be parsed, read, you know, written and read. And that's what the helm toolkit does. It provides functionality like those things that I've listed here uh, that then allows these tools to work with, edit uh, and uh, operate on the helm strings. And I'll just close with a note about the future. So IUPAC and Pistoia have actually partnered to formalize the standard as an IUPAC recommendation, at which point IUPAC will then take over its, man its life cycle management, the future development of the HELM specification, support ongoing scientific development, broaden the community engagement across uh, additional scientific communities, and then work together to plan for the sustainability of the tool set. And I'll ask you at your leisure when you get the slides later, please take note of the over 100 people from 30 organizations that contributed to the development of Helm. And I'll leave you with the note of the uh, representation of IUPAC's uh, subcommittee, which includes both legacy folks from that long-term uh, Helm project at Pasoya, as well as experts and connections to various other uh, IUPAC divisions and committees. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dana, for that excellent overview of Helm. Um, I think your final slides point to the uh, amount of effort that has to go into developing these things and also touches on the sustainability issue, which I know you sort of mentioned as something we might want to discuss um, in the panel discussion. Um, but I think it also highlights one of the sort of more current frontiers, which is how do we precisely characterize ambiguity? And I think that's yeah. obviously a challenge in the biological sphere, but becoming increasingly of interest in the chemical sphere as well. So thank you very much. You. Okay, um, who's next um, now? Um, next, we have Jonathan Goodman, who is Professor of Chemistry at the University of 
Cambridge. Uh, he is also my Uber boss because one of the things he does in his spare time is that he is chair of CCDC, where I work. Um, that's just one of his many additional activities. Um, he's been instrumental and influential in advancing Inchi as secretary of the IUPAC subcommittee. Um, but what we've asked him to talk about today is the topic of graphical representations and I think in a way this is the sort of where it starts for a lot of real chemists isn't it it's kind of what they draw um, that is the sort of beginning of um, these, 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 these sort of um, more computational representations that we're talking about so looking forward to hearing what you've got to say and Jonathan over to you. Thank you very much. Um, graphical representations is a, is a wonderful subject and um, I noticed only 61% of people use them in the survey earlier, though I, I think 100% of presentations so far have used them. So I'm kind of wondering what the other 39% of people do. Um, but I just looked through my, um, some of my old files for rec um, graphical reputations I've been um, using um, in yeah. papers over the last um, few years. So here are some, some examples, the, the top one, so um, here, the graphical representation tells you whether the molecules exist or not. Um, and spoiler alert, they don't. So maybe we don't need a, um, an identifier for them. Um, and the top right, this is thinking about inorganic reactivity. Um, in the bottom left, this gives you information about binding to anions. Only WIMPs bind to cations. Anions are much more difficult. And in the bottom right, so what, is, uh, what on earth is that representation? Well, um, this is a really interesting molecule which can only really be expressed in movement. Um, all of these are, are graphical representations and they're all machine readable in the sense you're all reading them as machine, um, but they're also really rather difficult to interpret unless your machine also reads the paper which accompanies them, um, which requires um, quite a high level of, of machine learning and also a, um, a, a lack of interest in copyright rules. So these are useful, um, representations. But I think when we talk about graphical representations, um, too much data is actually a bad thing. I, I probably shouldn't admit that I don't like data. But if we can throw away as much data as possible to get down to the really key ideas of um, graphical representation, then that should be very helpful. So if we throw away everything which is just decorative, then this is a sort of graphical representation that actually every speaker so far has also used, just um, a line drawing. And I'd like to suggest these are an extraordinarily high technology, particularly um, the, um, the, the two in the middle here. They, they look simple, though anyone who teaches undergraduate courses on this sort of thing will realize just how they are. Even the question of which way up do you draw them um, has no straightforward answer. Um, the answers, so far as they exist, um, are in these two wonderful papers by Jonathan Drecker um, giving the UPAC recommendations. Um, these papers are really extremely good. I put the um, DOIs in the chat. Um, so I, we could do a survey later of, um, of who has read them and who has memorized every aspect of them. So there's a, um, they do um, explain how to do graphical representation very well, um, but they're perhaps not absolutely perfect and it's really complicated. Benzene is a fairly straightforward example. If we look at xylene, well, in xylene, where do you put the double bonds? This is a perfectly good representation on the left. This is a perfectly good representation on the right, but they're different. Is the double bond between these two um, branching groups or not? Um, Inchi only has, there's only one inch for both of these structures, which is um, either useful or it prevents the Inchi requiring the um, prejudices and inspirations of the um, author, depending how you look at it. Um, nicotine, of course, this isn't really nicotine. This is a vasomate of nicotine. Nicotine is a single enantiomer. Um, the graphical representation expresses that ambiguity really quite clearly. Um, Inchi and smiles can do that too, or we could add extra information which takes the ambiguity out. Um, and this is not always straightforward, even for remdesivir. I tried to draw the same molecule of remdesivir twice, and I think I have successfully drawn the same molecule twice. But um, ChemDraw gives me a different um, Inchi key for these, so they're not the same. Um, but they're not the same if you look at the Inchi key carefully um, because of their stereochemistry and not because of anything else. So um, graphical representation is not easy to draw in an entirely consistent way. Um, and on the next slide, I have one of my favorite molecules here on the left. I call this TRIP. Um, its proper name, I'm not going to try to pronounce. Um, 
But this is a, a really important catalyst. It's um, very widely used. Um, and even drawing it in two dimensions is really quite hard. So this is an isopropyl group. I've drawn it like an arrow because there isn't really room to draw it any other way. If anyone has a more, more beautiful way of drawing TRIP as a graphical rep representation, that would be great. It's hop isomer, as I've indicated here in the graphical um, representation. Um, the um, inchy key, um, for people who like inchy keys, shows this is, the inchy thinks this is an ufa oiser molecule, which means it doesn't realize it's an edge hop isomer. That's an issue that the Inchi Trust is working on, and Smiles also has an issue with atrop isomers. If you want to know why this is such a good asymmetric catalyst, then actually drawing it this way isn't terribly helpful. It's much more useful to draw it in this way, leaving out a lot of the information. But um, if you draw it this way, you can begin to see whether it will be an R or an S asymmetric catalyst. So um, graphical representations are intrinsically complicated. These are crystal structures. Who knows where the bonds are? Difficult to simplify this. Um, and then we can go further back in time to um, how Dalton drew things, even more complicated molecules. So graphical representations are great. Everybody uses them, whether they know it or not. Um, read Jonathan Drecker's papers for, for good advice. Um, and I will stop there. Okay, thank you very much, Jonathan, for um, um, that, 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 that overview of some of the simplicity, complexity, all wrapped up into one. I spent a long time looking at that remdesivir kind of um, pair of structures there saying, what's the difference? And all I could see was a cyano group that made it change its mind about the um, stereochemistry, but maybe that was a red herring. I don't know. It was. <laughs> yeah. And that's just how it was drawn. Essentially, it was to, to, if I'm a machine interpreting that, they're the same thing to me, but clearly not to chemdraw. So. Mm. Um, um, thank you very much indeed. Um, right, we're going to now move on to some of the sort of, you know, very, very traditional ways in which, which chemical structures have um, been represented and think about systematic nomenclature. And we're pleased that we're joined here by Michelle Rogers. Um, Michelle has currently works for Cargill, which is a global food corporation. She's previously worked in the area of engine oils and lubricants. And common to um, all of this has been an involvement in compliance and regular, reg, regulatory aspects um, of this, an area where a, you know, a precise description is pretty important. Um, Michelle's been involved in a number of ACS and IUPAC activities, specifically in the area of nomenclature and terminology. And currently she is president of IUPAC Division 8, which is very much relevant to this particular domain. So one of the best people to have along to talk, um, speak to us about this. Thank you for taking the time. We look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Ian. Are my slides sharing? Because they're not for me. They are showing for me and hopefully for everybody okay. else. <laughs> Excellent. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the more traditional systematic representation, but I might take a little bit of a twist on it from the traditional IUPAC standards. Um, when I think about systematic representation, I really think about it as how do you capture a unique chemical identity and, you know, for those of you who haven't seen it, you know, here's just a slight read on organic nomenclature. Um, the most recent version of the IUPAC Blue Book that really defines, um, you know, systematic structure-based nomenclature. But when you move into the industrial setting, which is really where I work, um, sometimes we can't capture that unique um, chemical structure or that unique chemical identity and exclusively a structure-based way. Um, and so when we get into systematic representation, in addition to the traditional IUPAC standards, there are also places where source-based nomenclature and process-based nomenclature are really used to help identify a unique chemical identity. Um, and for the purposes of today, I just wanted to share with you something that we all would think of would be relatively simple to identify the representation for, um, but actually is exceptionally difficult. Um, you know, if we look at something like a triglyceride, um, which is naturally occurring, you know, we draw a standard representation 
Um, but that standard representation doesn't capture the complexity of the molecules that actually make up that triglyceride. We can use IUPAC nomenclature to capture the unique structural determination of every possible isomer. But from a realistic perspective um, of someone working in industry, capturing the unique IUPAC names of each and every possible isomer combination doesn't actually really help us um, describe the molecule that you know, we're placing on the market. And so when we start looking at these examples, we end up having source-based nomenclature, or sorry, structure-based nomenclature that looks more like things like it's a triglyceride C1618 and C18 unsaturated, really capturing, you know, that this molecule is completely a triglyceride. Um, it's made up of, you know, the fatty acid chains being 16 and 18 in length and with the 18 being unsaturated. Um, or if you're not quite as specific on it, it has to be exclusively a triglyceride you can have a more generic name of glyceride C1618. If we move into source-based nomenclature, so this is really about where is the material derived from, and this particularly becomes important for biologically-based molecules. The triglyceride 1618 could be used to describe soybean oil, canola oil, rapeseed oil, corn oil, coconut, co not coconut, chocolate or cacao oil, cottonseed oil, and sunflower oil. Each one of these from a chemical compliance perspective in, depending on the country you are importing or exporting to for industrial applications, may or may not be compliant for selling when you look at it from a source-based nomenclature perspective. Um, and that's not even within taking into account genetic modifications that have been made to these different plant species. The third type of nomenclature we get to is a process-based nomenclature, which I realize most people wouldn't reconstitute a triglyceride, a triglyceride, but I wanted to use it as an example of if you actually made the molecule I have shown on the right, from starting with glycerin as a molecule and the fatty acids, you could wind up with a name for that product of glycerin reaction products with palmitic acid, stearic acid, oleic acid, and linolenic acid, um, if you were starting off with very pure sources of each one of those fatty acids. Or from a process-based perspective in industry, you could wind up with a name of glycerin reaction products with fatty acids, C1618 and C18 unsaturated. So there's a lot of ways when you start looking at systematic nomenclature of capturing um, and representing the same structure, but each one of them brings a slightly different set of information to the product. Um, and this becomes a big portion of what we look at um, on the industrial side when we look at where can we bring products legally to market around the world, these types of differences can actually make a big difference in whether you can or cannot um, market a product, even though fundamentally from a chemistry perspective, they might perform and act the exact same way. So thank you, Ian, and I'll pass it back to you. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. I, I think that links a number of things that have been featured in some of the talks um, um, throughout this afternoon or this morning, depending where you are. Um, uh, I think Jonathan in his early slides sort of had the pictures and said, actually, you need the context from the paper. I think Greg um, talked about different levels of description. Um, and I think, you know, here you sort of presented something there that it is very contextual as to what it is that we need to be able to communicate. So I think that, that kind of reflects some of those themes. Thank you very much. Um, we are now going to move into a panel discussion. So if I could invite all of the speakers to turn on their cameras. And uh, if we could flip over to gallery mode um, on the... Uh, Thing, which may be under my own control. That's better. Um, I, I, I'd, I'd encourage anybody in the audience who wants to raise some questions again to put it in the chat, but I'd like to start it 
off a little bit with that sort of, you know, 61% say that the representations we have are adequate. Um, so I'd be interested in getting your initial reaction to the sort of question of, well, what's what's left to do in order to you know, get to that point where, where, where we can say as a community, the representations that we have are excellent. And in thinking about that, what is what is the sort of number one or two priorities that we should be focusing on? And we'll go in order of the speakers as we had it. So, Greg, first over to you. So I think from the perspective of thinking about it, small molecules, I mean, Dan, Dana's area of the biomolecules, I think, is a whole another can of worms and is an interesting one, but it, it kind of has its own challenges. Um, from the perspective of small molecules, the two big ones that I currently see are um, adequate representations of organometallics, um, which is made extremely difficult by the fact that the graphical representation of those is in no way even remotely standardized. Um, so doing anything machine readable is very challenging, but that's an open challenge. The other one that I think is probably a little bit easier, but we have major representational challenges with is atrop isomers. Um, as Jonathan mentioned, I mean, this is starting to become incredibly important. More and more people are starting to really take advantage of this, this property of, of some pairs of molecules. And we just don't have a good way in our standard um, chemical representations to distinguish those molecules from each other at all. So those are those to me are the big things. Thank you. Uh, ben. Um, yeah, I think, I guess, coming in fr from a, a perspective of, you know, trying to help with some standardization efforts, I think collecting kind of the, the bugs and the different use cases for um, some of the issues are, are is a big challenge, you know, trying to lead an effort like that to collect all the information in one place. Um, and I think for kind of for the chemists more broadly, I don't think you should necessarily have to worry. I don't, I don't think chemists should necessarily have to worry about, you know, if they take a smile string or an inchy string and open it up in a piece of software, they should be reasonably confident that it's going to be the same regardless of which software or toolkit they use. So um, I think, you know, we're almost there, but just need to make a make a better effort and maybe in the meantime i think uh as a good practice for the community it would be good to kind of put what what version of software you use sort of the you know created these smiles in open babble version 3.1 point whatever uh, would be a, a a useful best practice for the time being thank you um dana yeah welcome to the can of worms um, <laughs> Uh, so, so within the, even the current use cases that Helm is meant to support, um, you know, there's, there is a defined set of monomers that were created by the project and it was based on, you know, prevalence that, that, that some prioritization had to take place, but, you know, because the, the, the synthesis and the chemical modification of those monomers is just a constant thing, you know, in the companies that are creating these, we, we definitely need a process and some approaches for more rapidly defining um, a standard monomer, right, across a very distributed uh, community uh, that we'll be creating. And that includes, you know, some very compact nomenclature. We need to maintain uniqueness of that symbol that we use in the chain. Um, and then, you know, there's, uh, there's also the uh, you know, some desire out there to have something to use to define uniqueness in the same way, even with the with some of the gaps that uh, you guys have pointed out, right, to be able to use the entry or smiles or canonical smiles for uniqueness and registration system. We can't do that with Helm now. And that that would be very powerful. Um, currently, you know, there's there's all kinds of effectively workarounds in, in registering biologics, which has a lot more to do with, as Michelle spoke, to capturing the process. Um, uh, the, the ratio of the glycosylation, the phosphorylation, the antibody drug conjugation is a function of the process that created it. Um, you tweak the experimental conditions, you get a different result. And then there's, there's other communities outside of peptides and nucleic acids that need some polymer descriptions as well. So there is a, a, a nascent effort to apply it to glycans. Um, there's a, a good white paper and uh, 
actually we're looking for people that are interested in, in working on that and fleshing that out to an extension of the helm specification and there's some some potential for for lipids so in those communities in and of themselves you know have that focus but then just generally to handle biology we need we need those other melodies to define as well okay thank you jonathan um i i think the current adequate state is a, is a tremendously useful adequate state um, and I think we'll never get to excellence. And I'm really I'm optimistic about this because this just shows how interesting chemistry is. That um, the things which um, Greg highlights and the big molecules um, then I mentioned, I mean, these are real challenges, which I'm sure we'll get better and better at describing. And as soon as we do, we'll discover other subtleties, which currently we, we can't really talk about, but we will be able to. So um, I think the pursuit of excellence is, um, is a noble aim and it's great that we'll never get there. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Point well made. Um, and then Michelle. I mean, on systematic nomenclature, you know, we're continuing to evolve and grow in our understanding of how to name things. I think one of the biggest challenges we continue to face is, you know, standardizing how we define non-standard structures where you can't actually draw a single structure you might not even know what you're making actually as far as a structural representation um, and how you capture that and how you use that um, for registration purposes, but also for modeling and other things has been a significant challenge um, in the industrial space. And you know, I work on a very global basis. And interestingly enough, I have oftentimes six different names depending on the country and not due to translation issues for the same molecule that's been interpreted by different governments around the world to have a different structure. And so it always is a unique challenge when you're looking at molecules where you can't begin to draw a standard structure because you don't even have a starting point. Okay, thank you. Um, we have had some specific questions to you in the q and I do just want to give you an opportunity to address those. I think some of these you lead on to mixtures of stuff. So maybe I'll just after this, you know, if, if any of the other panel members have views on mixtures and the challenges specifically associated with that. Um, the first question I think probably relates a little bit to what you're talking about, but uh, yeah, are there indexing systems that you that attempt to link those different representations that you, you spoke of so that if you get search for one you'll get pointed to the other two how how what what's the current state of search tools when it comes to being able to sort of bridge those conceptual um uh, sort of representations in my experience um very poor um a lot of it comes down to um particularly on the regulatory side and that's really where i work it comes down to you understanding how the different um potential ways to name the same structure um, there aren't good correlation tools it really comes down to the chemist having the understanding of i could call this same structure these six different things and then searching each one of those separately unfortunately mm. on the regulatory side today there's no good um, linker and when you look at mixture representation some of the molecules i've worked with if we would define the the single product that's produced by process as a mixture we'd be talking in a traditional IUPAC nomenclature sense, over 200 unique structures when you start looking at, um, starting with molecules like, you know, tetra, you know, uh, something where you take a oligomer that's branched and then it's isomerized and then attached, like you just end up getting almost an infinite combination of potential structures, mm. so. Yeah. Okay, um, so yeah, the specific question on that was how do you represent a created mixture of unique chemicals and differentiate this to a natural product, for example, cocoa oil? Um, Not well would be the answer. <laughs> yeah, <indeed>. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> there's no, in all the modeling work I've done and all the attempting to, and this particularly becomes a challenge um, for modeling toxicology, where oftentimes we try to use a smile or an inchy to model potential toxicology results, the output of that modeling is very dependent on which structure or structures for your molecule you put in. Okay, yeah, so. thank you. Um, it's probably worth noting at this point that there is the Minchi project, which is looking to use Inchi and 
using that to sort of represent mixtures in all their kind of variations of representations. Um, do any of the other panel member have comments on mixtures, challenges that they've encountered, um, solutions? I mean, formulations in many pharma companies has always been sort of a challenge that the, the means in which they're captured in different systems across different departments, even within the same company can be fairly different. Yeah. Um, but, it, you know, I, I've seen some approaches to try and manage that, but those were kind of internal and sort of locally thought out. The, only, the other thing that's interesting, to, back to the question about the indexing back and forth, right, is that some of these representations capture different information. Some of them capture more or less information. So you might suffer from information loss. You can go one direction, but not the other, or you might not be able to translate all of the context that something um, includes. So you almost would have to have a system that includes if statements <laughs> to go to, to, to convert or you know enumerates all the possibilities in the other space. Um, I think the next question I'd like to explore, I think sort of suggested a little bit by um, Jonathan's talk, and I think it's bridging between the depictions that chemists are using and the representations we want under the hood and I think Bin you touched a little bit on um, sort of like chemists shouldn't have to really worry about some of these sort of things maybe I'll start with you on this do you want to just elaborate a little bit more on you know your take on what it is that the regular chemists should need to know about and what should be what they shouldn't need to worry about and then who's how do we how do we make sure that we insulate them from um, you know what 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 they shouldn't need to worry about yeah, um, I guess what I was sort of referring to or trying to get to is that I think, you know, and I'm thinking chemists, I'm thinking practicing chemists, um, you know, maybe, you know, or, or organic chemist. I think, you know, having an appreciation for inchy smiles and mole file and helm and these different file formats is good, but I don't necessarily expect them to, you know, be able to encode their own smiles or, you know, understand the the, the differences of them. They should be able to you know, load a smiles into a piece of software, you know, do some modifications and then export, you know, a different smiles and be reasonably confident that what they are exchanging will be um, received by the other, you know, chemist and interpreted the same way. That's sort of what I was getting at. And, um, and then also maybe an appreciation, well, not maybe, but an appreciation for what, what you can do with things like Greg had touched on, you know, is Inchi an identifier or a representation and understanding, you know, what is the correct use case for Inchi with my application? And maybe, maybe it makes sense if you're making, you know, a, a laboratory chemical list to keep track of them with Inchis, but you wouldn't necessarily want to sort of recreate the representation with, with Inchi or um, doing that, you have to do so with caution, say. So. Okay. I saw Greg some nodding there. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? I think one of the things that is would help and from the, the data integrity and fairness perspective is if there was some more awareness by people that when we, we shouldn't expect chemists to know the details of the underlying file formats or representations, but to understand the distinction between the things, the information that can pass from their sketching tool to those formats and the information that cannot. I mean, so the, the, to this recognition, I mean, Jonathan showed a great example for the HRP isomer where some of the bonds were drawn in bold. I mean, this is, this is one of my bugaboos because that's a sketching, that's a sketch and it's a beautiful image of the molecule that's very evocative. And for a chemist looking at it, you can immediately tell what it is, but that information doesn't actually translate into any of the standard formats that we use. I mean, so it disappears. And so recognizing the, the, what it is that they're creating and and for them to decide this is fine because I'm creating a beautiful image that will convey my knowledge to other chemists in a paper but in the end it's not going to be machine readable right it is inherently not fair 
um, because it's not interoperable. Um, and I think some education around that, even though it gets people a little bit into the weeds of what goes on in the back, I think it's essential if we ever really want to get to the point that most of our data are fair and reusable. Um, Jonathan. I, I, I'm not sure if people shouldn't understand Smiles and Dintry, because I mean, the key thing is people have to understand something. And um, understanding a stick drawing, a, a standard graphical representation, I mean, they're, they're quite extraordinary technology. We, I think we forget, they look obvious, but it's taken a long time to get to them. They encode a, a huge amount of data, some of which, as Craig says, very top isomers, it's not quite clear what they're encoding always, but they're trying to do something. But if we don't quite understand those, then we're going from a, 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 a format of representation we don't understand to representations we understand even less. And it's clear that at some point problems are going to come in. Thank you. Um, Dana. Um, sorry, on, on representations? <laughs> I, I think it's how we bridge the, any thoughts around how uh, we yeah. um, sort of bridge the human and the machine, really, yeah. because I think what we're hearing here is humans, you know, humans, humans aspire to aesthetics, machines yeah. kind of just want that precise representation. Yeah, and, and, and Helm, Helm demonstrates that in spades, right? I, I intentionally put up the antibody drug conjugate uh, helm string to illustrate that. that there's, there's, you know, we don't, nobody should have to worry about writing that out. Um, although in my early training as a computational chemist, I was, I was taught that any good computational chemist has to be able to write your own Z matrix. So sit down and do it now. So, <laughs> but we don't expect that a chemist or, or biologist or biochemist. And, and that's where the, the importance of the tools the sketcher is right. The, something that that draws it at a, at a level of abstraction, um, but in the string itself underneath encodes, you know, the, the deeper information. In some ways, actually, it's I guess the the, the Helm model has inverted the, the chemistry model in that sense, right? Where you know, graphically, the, the, you can capture more in the in the sketch in the graph than a smiles can, but the the Helm string itself. With reference subsequently to the monomers definitions, captures way more detail than the simple what we could sometimes call beads on a string sketch. Yeah. And without that, it would be it would be utterly um, it would be pretty limited. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Thanks, um, Michelle. Any thoughts on expression versus representation? <laughs> uh, I think in the in the systematic world, you know, getting a good representation of, you know, particularly complex molecules um, is a challenge and there isn't really a good standard for it when you can write a very detailed structure that's a single isomer, systematic representation um, in the traditional IUPAC sense works relatively well. Um, once you be, move beyond a single stereoisomer um, into Marcouche and other types of structures, the most of the standard systematic representations end up falling into more of a process-based nomenclature, which at this point still doesn't really have, outside of chemical abstract services, um, definitions really uh, a standardized way of doing it, so. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any thoughts on where in our overall infrastructure we should be targeting improvements we hear a lot about drawing tools are they the problem is it the informatics infrastructures that we have is that where we should be sort of focusing our attention to better embed improved representations um, I don't know if that forms a good question or not but um, Well, you know, there's there's definitely opportunities to continue to enhance and enrich the specifications. It sounds like, right? So, can't capture HO biases. Yeah. So we need to figure out a way to do that, to, to so that, that it's not fully lossy going from the, the screen to the to the single line notation. Um, 
or you know other other ambiguities or things that, that get lost. Um, I guess the other is, you know, in absence of a canonicalization, you know, how else do you uh, ensure that three different tools don't have three different sort of interpretations of reading or writing? Mm -hmm. That's I, to, to build on what Dana just said, I think that, that is an important point, which is what we have, we're missing something, and Vin is working on this with Smiles Plus, but we're really missing a good kind of central standardized community agreed upon definition of many of the representations that we have. Um, so Helm, Helm is a model of how this could work. I mean, I think that that's been more or less open from the, almost the beginning um, and has, has expanded things and we have a nice specification there. But if you wanna look for a representation on the chemistry side, something that is focused more on kind of as losslessly as possible conveying chemical information, um, we really don't have much out there. Um, so there's the effort that Ben is doing on, on SMILES. You can imagine us picking one or two other formats and doing something similar. Mm -hmm. um, that I, and I think that would be valuable for interoperability um, for the, the really specifically for the interoperability part of the fair pieces for findable I think we're good with inchy and you know once we get inchy to expand it to the other types um, we're in good shape but if you want to think about an interoperability you just have to understand what the format means and you don't need to get into complicated things like canonicalization and are these two things the same in this particular format? Um, so I think if we just had a good, one or two good solid chemical representations where we have an authoritative source that we can go to and say, this is what this actually means in that representation, I think it would really help this overall process enormously. Um, and then that could be used as output from the tools like the sketchers, et cetera, and they would know what how they're supposed to interpret things when they write them to, right? Okay, thank you. Ben, did you have some thoughts? Oh yeah, I was just gonna say, I think we touched on it before, just the, the education side of it would just um, almost, you know, maybe a table that shows, you know, I wanna use smiles, these are the features that it can encode. And so some of that's probably out there, but just, you know, getting that all in one place so that somebody can quickly um, see, you know, what can I code in, in, in Inchi? What can I use smiles for um, and so forth and even, documenting some, you know, successful, um, simple use cases would help people understand, you know, what these um, identifiers and representations are kind of appropriate to be used for or best used in certain applications. I think that would be helpful to um, collect that documentation. Okay. Um, I, you go yeah. I, I think we need to decide what's, what's essential for each particular application. So, and I think this is more or less worked out for small organic molecules. We don't usually care about conformations, but for proteins, we obviously do. Um, and as we move from small organic molecules to larger molecules, larger organometallics, then exactly what's important about any of these molecules is, is still a, an area for debate. And if we can come to an agreement on what's absolutely essential about a particular structure, then we can begin to encode it. And I think the good news is we're almost there for a huge number, or we are there for a huge number of useful molecules, but we're not there for all molecules. And there are many interesting systems where we're not quite sure what's critical about them and what distinguishes um, different systems from each other. Um, and then there are nanomaterials, in, in case anyone thinks uh, that we're close to working things out. Michelle, do you have any thoughts on nanomaterials? <laughs> Uh, other than we're working on a definition for systematic nomenclature for carbon nanotubes currently in Division 8, that's an ongoing project that will help at least start to scratch the very beginning surface of uh, defining some of the uh, nanostructure related systematic nomenclature. In my mind, one of the biggest challenges is, I think Jonathan put it well, is what do we want to capture and how do we relate it? And this really, you know, for me, I'm coming a lot of this, as you know, from an industrial perspective, but, you know, you know, 
there's a push, obviously, in many places to run less testing run, and do more modeling. And without knowing what is the key functional driver of the molecule, you don't necessarily know what to encode. So identifying what those key parameters are that we're really looking to capture in a representation, um, I think is really key in deciding how we standardize as we move forward and what that key might be and what that key representation is may be very different depending on the application that you're looking at. And so I think we may never get to one standard representation capturing all the information that people might be looking for when we look towards different applications of how that representation is used. And I, and I think as you've been talking and as this sort of panel has been sort of unraveling, I think there's an element, the, the sort of other, other way of thinking about how we describe molecules is sort of thinking more about classification, um, which starts to be lot, much less precise than a precise molecular representation, but what role does that have, which takes us into ontologies, all sorts of things like that. And that's an element we might feature in the next webinar, so in webinar in the series as well. Um, I think there's a que another question that's come in, and I think this will be my kind of final question. And I think if I can sort of interpret it a little bit, I think it raises some interesting questions. Um, uh, so, the request is asking for comment on the interplay between standards organizations, uh, the customers who, 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 i.e., i.e., in industry particularly, but then also the sort of vendor sketches, you know, your vendors who are providing the systems that are going to provide these different, different representations. Who should have the final say? And I think as to what I guess the right answer is, or do we have to sit with multiple options? Now, I think chemistry is very, very interesting because we thrive on de facto standards. We also thrive on formalized standards. Um, is that a hybrid mix, something we should just expect to live with, or should we be working to standardize more? And then, you know, where do the responsibilities sit? Um, Dana, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm very much an advocate of trying to create as broad a community as manageable for the standards process. And it's really important, I think, to include both, in, as described here, you know, users from, from the customers, the tools, and the technical people building the tools. Um, I think I think sometimes if you if you bias it one you know, start down the process with one expert community without necessarily including the people that have to implement these standards or the people that are using them, you you miss things right because everybody's got a slightly different focus and I think if from the outset or as soon as you have the opportunity you bring in you know at least three or four of those perspectives at the same time I think. Um, you can you can diminish the degree of, of uh, oper operability problems that we see in some of these cases where, where things don't translate. And the other is, you know, I think these should should all sort of come with test suites, right, or test uh, um, examples right, that, that everybody can feel good about. You know, putting a stamp on it, it passed all these tests, and therefore, as far as we know, it should work interoperably. Thank you. Um, Greg, from the point of view of someone who develops these toolkits, whom some might see as the arbiter, if our kit says that, that's the right answer. I, I don't think anybody actually believes that. <laughs> Certainly not me. <laughs> um, so I, I think that from my putting, wearing my hat of the, the I guess the vendor, um, to the extent the free software has a vendor, um, I think that there's always going to be extensions, right? Um, as Jonathan said, the world of chemistry is so diverse that you know the moment we think we're done, there's going to be something new. Um, and so there's always going to be extensions and things that people add on and proprietary bits that happen. But what would be really nice is to have a common agreed upon baseline that we can point to for cases when we say, okay, the molecule you want to represent it has we can support it nicely with some extensions but if we don't support it if we don't want to use the extensions here's this common agreed upon baseline that we use and here is a authoritative definition of that that somebody other than me provides 
right? I, it's nice for me, and I try to do this with the article whenever possible, it's nice to me if I can punt the whole discussion about whether or not I'm right by just pointing to an IUPAC document. Um, and I would love to be able to do that with with things other than Inchi, um, because it would make my life easier. Of course, I'm going to have extensions, but I would like for base the base case to have the, the something really authoritative to point to. Okay. And I think um, that would bring value. Just a quick question: We're putting smiles to one side for a moment. Are there other sort of representation formats where you think that's a priority? Yeah, so the mole the mole file format. <laughs> I think I could have guessed that question. <laughs> that answer, but, yeah. um, Vin, as someone who is kind of doing what Greg's sort of like, you know, kind of suggesting we do there, anything you want to say to build on that? Um, not much to add other than I think, yeah, having a core sign of kind of baseline standard would benefit everybody, you know, customers, vendors, developers. Um, and ideally it would be agreed upon, right? You don't want to pass a standard that people don't like. So hopefully people are contributing and commenting um before it's sort of an approved authoritative standard so everyone would kind of have their say in it and then um you don't want to stop people from ever doing anything so yeah have as many extensions as you want but that doesn't necessarily conform to the base standard and i think that's i think that's perfectly fine mm -hmm. um jonathan i was just agreeing Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll go there. I think to finish this off, I'll go to Michelle then. And then if you want to say something about IUPAC and IUPAC's role here as president of one of its most relevant <laughs> divisions. Here. What I'd say is I think we're always going to have a combination of, you know, standards that are developed by international agencies, international groups like IUPAC that get agreed upon, formalized, published, and we can nicely point to it from pure and applied chemistry, but those often take years and, an, and a new emerging chemistry has to hit a certain level of maturity generally before a new systematic standard for its chemical nomenclature representation is going to be written. So I always think at some point we're always going to have a bit of a community development of a recognition of how we share information among the community that is not yet formalized because um, new chemistry has to reach a certain level of maturity before you can define a standard for it. So there's always gonna be that lag in when an international standard can be developed relative to new and emerging fields, so. Mm. And I suppose it's but we try question. our best in Division Eight, but yeah, we always need more people, and it is coming up on our UPAC election season. If you're interested, <laughs> <laughs> excellent plan. Um, um, yeah, and I guess that's interesting, and it's not something I've really thought about, and and and, and how 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 um, yeah, is it the case that perhaps the majority of standards actually evolve from stuff that's been done at a grassroots level and sort of become established practice before it comes to standards? How much standards activity is top down saying, oh, we must have a standard for X. I'm sure it's usually because people have realized they need a standard and have started working towards it. it feeds in. Um, there was one final um, question that um, came in and I think it's, 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 um, uh worth just raising and it was should there be more resources put towards the training assistance of the scientist who desires to use tools such as a chemistry sketcher as to its limitations etc rather than expecting little of them and i guess the question is does anyone here think that we are yeah does, does anyone want to say anything about the level of investment i think it's probably fair to say more training is always good but yeah how much more i saw Vin, you came off mute there i was just uh, i was just going to say yes of course yeah. that, that would be beneficial uh maybe one thing to think about would be for some uh uh, you know, a, re a repository of good training materials that others can easily re reuse would be the only thing that comes to mind. Um, cookbooks, things like that, where um, educators can go to them and, and use them in courses. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I shall, I don't know if you have a sense from an industry perspective of the sort of literacy of people coming into um, the chemistry industry these days as to yeah how prepared they are to deal with the nuances of these tools. Um, I think there's still opportunities for significant improvement 
in that area. But again, it depends on very much what you're trying to do with the tool. Are you trying to just store a, a structural representation or are you trying to utilize it for modeling to depict properties? But I also think particularly in the systematic nomenclature, I don't think anyone wants to teach this as a grad school course. Um, but, you know, there are places where, you know, this 1600 pages has been condensed down into a four page brief guide to really help educators. And I think there are other places where on things like the INCHI, could we create similar brief high level guides that would really describe some of the benefits, but also clearly lay out the limitations that could be used um, as part of education. Um, both at the undergrad, both at the high school undergraduate and graduate levels, just so that there is a clear understanding of what the different representations provide and what they don't provide to the users. Okay. And Jonathan, other um, things you have aspirations to teach your undergraduates? Oh, I, I, um, the, the problem with putting more things in undergraduate courses is you then have to leave other things out. So, how important is this compared with the Diels Alder reaction or asymmetric analysis or or other things we might? consider are important. And also, I, I wonder if the, the current tools are too good in that I try and tell people how to use ChemDraw properly. And um, my students, this might reflect my institution, ignore what I say, go away, try it out themselves and do pretty well. Um, but they don't get all of the, the subtleties. So either um, we make um, the, these um, drawing resources harder to use, so you can't just try them out <laughs> and get them to work, which is probably the wrong approach, or we um, realize that people are going to do that so how can people just experiment them experiment with them and be led to produce precise structures and i think that's a much harder question but that's probably where we should aspire to go okay i think it's interesting that there's possibly a role for thinking about validation services here and particularly ones that can feed back to the user as well so it's sort of like if it detects something that's not in compliance with expectation or standards they learn from that and i think that's partly what we're thinking about with that sort of one of those work packages under world fair dana is there anything you wanted to add to this um two, two thoughts one is i wonder if there's a place for you know those in iupac that have an educational focus to generate sort of minimal or recommended curricula right here's the things you really should know um, as a as a as a developing scientist in your domain, the other is like maybe maybe infusing the tools, but uh, gamifying some some online courses, right? And with little quizzes, you know. So if you can get five structures from the sample set correct in a row, then you get a twenty dollar coupon for pizza or something. <laughs> cool, pizza is driving the next generation. Greg, any comments on this particular topic? It is the fuel of college, is it not? I mean, come on. <laughs> no, on this one, I think it's all been covered from my perspective. Brilliant, thank you. And I will now take the opportunity to thank all of you very much for both contributing your talks, contributing to this wide ranging and informative um, discussion. Um, I just want to add my thanks to the ACS for providing the, the platform here and to Fatima, who's going to um, kind of um, wind this up with some final comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ian, for the great moderation. Thank you for our amazing speaker. Thank you, Greg, Dana, Jonathan, Michelle, Ben. Ben, do you guys see my slide? Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. For Thank you for our audience for joining from different time zones. And I'm happy here to share for some final closing remarks. Uh, so here is our great speakers um, contacts. So if you want to continue the conversation with them, they are happy to stay connected. If you want to take a picture for this slide. Uh, so I think this is the time. Uh, then I think we will have another poll, which is a kind of feedback. Well, we want to have like your feedback before you go. So uh, if Andrew and Hannah can help us in launching this poll, perhaps for one minute, that would be great. So you might need to scroll down a little bit. So we have around um, six questions. So that will be great if you let us know what do you think about this event and what you like to see in the um, future.
All right, so maybe while the uh, submission is still on, I can share with you here some of upcoming events that we do have. So uh, we decided to continue with this webinar series. So we have another uh, fourth webinar coming. The next one will be definitely in the spring of uh, 2023. So the webinar will be about what is a chemical again, and we will try to discuss advanced chemical descriptions over there. Uh, we do have a couple of webinars with association with the uh, IOC and Kim Voices Project and a, another um, a, web, a joint webinar with this USNC as well. We will be present in person in uh, Gutenberg uh, with the RDA uh, uh, meeting in March, as well as we will have an in-person workshop in the uh, ACS spring meeting, and that will be with uh, a collaboration with the American Chemical Society Chemical Information Division. Uh, we will have in-person workshop. We will be um, uh, having some initial prototypes about and uh, some prototypes and surfaces that were developed uh, by our project. So we will be happy to test these, and we will be um, uh, glad if you can if you are there to to attend this uh, workshop. So um, uh, with that, I'll invite all of you to um, watch our um, webinar recording on our YouTube channel, as well as uh, the ACS publication will be glad as well to share the um, video with you um, a couple of days perhaps from now. Um, we are also happy to receive your um, requests or if you wanna contact us, um, have an, um, request any information or would like to know about other, other projects. Uh, please also follow us on social media, and uh, uh, here is our email con uh, contact as well. That's something you can also reach out through. Also, one of the outstanding projects of the IUPAC, we, I would like to invite you all to uh, keep your eye on the Global Warmer Breakfast, uh, which will happen in February 14 in the Valentine Day. So everybody is uh, invited to attend also to organize this uh, event. This is independently organized uh, 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 event where uh, every all basic sciences uh, are invited to join this global initiative, which started four years ago. And last year, for example, 400 breakfasts were registered uh, from across the, the globe in about like 80 countries. So that will be an interesting opportunity to join the conversation about and empower women in chemistry and science. Uh, with that, I'll be happy to thank you all, all the audience, all the speakers, uh, the, the host as well for, for, for being us. I would like to uh, have um, to uh, special thanks to the ACS publications for Andrew and Hannah for providing their um, help in hosting this uh, event and uh, looking forward to see you in a future events. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye.